On the morning of November 13, 1986, the body of 75-year-old Richard Finney was discovered in a living room chair in an East Mission Avenue apartment where he lived by himself in Ontario, California. Money, jewelry, and other miscellaneous items belonging to the victim had been stolen. Nevis, fingerprints, and blood belonging to the suspect were located inside the department by investigators at the time. Unfortunately, the case went cold until technological advances allowed for further examination of the evidence. The case was reopened in 2016. Investigators resubmitted the bloody handprint and a fingerprint found on the knob of a sink inside Richard's home. This time, they found a match. The fingerprint matched that of Nathan Eugene Matthews. Matthews submitted his fingerprints for a job application as a security guard and that was why investigators had his fingerprints on their database. Matthews was arrested in April 2018 at his home in Ontario in connection with the case. He was 31 years old when the crime took place. In May of 2022, Matthews pleaded guilty. Then two months later, in July, he was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. Before imposing the stipulated 15 years to life term, San Diego Superior Court Judge Carlos Amor said, the question as to who did this heinous crime has been answered. The question as to why it was done and how could somebody do this to someone who was obviously unable to defend himself may never be answered. Share your thoughts in the comments section. Also, if you like this content, subscribe please. We are very close to 1000 family. Let's continue the video. On July 17, 1992, a farm worker in San Mateo County, California found a woman's body near an irrigation pond. An autopsy showed that the victim passed away due to the blunt force trauma from a flat object to the back and left side of her skull. She was identified as 25-year-old Juliet Rivera. Juliet lived in Alameda and worked as a legal secretary. She had been reported missing by her family 10 days before her body was found. Her boyfriend, 50-year-old Abraham Riviera, soon became a suspect. He also went by the name of Gregory Mark Riviera. The police department and San Mateo County Sheriff's detectives questioned Riviera. They noticed numerous inconsistencies with the statement that he had made. They also found other unnamed evidence connecting him to the crime. An arrest warrant was issued for Riviera on August 7, 1992, but by the time they went to arrest him, he was long gone. Detectives found his apartment in Alameda abandoned. Juliet's case was featured on an episode of America's Most Wanted soon after Riviera disappeared. Riviera was added to the website Northern California Most Wanted, run by the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center, aimed at enlisting the public's help in finding individuals wanted by law enforcement. On the website, it said that Riviera has a U.S. Army background and auto mechanic experience. He loves to talk about his times in Hawaii and has been described as a person who loved the Bay Area and liked to attend social events and local bars. The breakthrough in the case would finally come in May of 2022. A transient man known as John Paul passed away in Merced County, California. A coroner then ran the man's fingerprints to locate his next of kin. Results showed that the man was actually Riviera. It turns out that Riviera used his brother's name and lived a transient lifestyle to stay under law enforcement's radar. He and his brother would often swap identities to keep law enforcement guessing. The San Mateo County Sheriff's Office had this to say in a statement based on this investigation with the identity of suspect Abraham Riviera, a.k.a. Gregory Mark Riviera, a.k.a. John Paul, finally located and now deceased. This case is closed. Public Information Officer Lieutenant Eamon Allen said, Here at the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office, a cold case does not mean a closed case. We investigate all cases thoroughly. Investigators are hoping that someone will come forward to shed light on why Riviera did what he did. 53-year-old John Stagner lived in Orlando, Florida in 1992. He was a hardworking maintenance employee for Orange County and was living on the county's maintenance property. During the early morning hours of August 10, 1992, deputies responded to a home on North Forsyth Road after John's wife found his body in bed. Orange County Sheriff John Minas said that John had head and facial trauma. The weapon was found in the room, a walking stick. The sheriff's office suspected John's neighbor, Ronald Cates. He had been a person of interest from the start. 
Cates reportedly had a drug habit at the time and would often borrow several power tools from John and pawn them to buy drugs. John had confronted him about it and asked him to return the tools. On the day John's life was taken, detectives went to Cates' house to speak with him about the case. But he had his daughter lie and say he wasn't home. Investigators later learned that he was hiding under the home that day. In the next few weeks, they did manage to interview Cates a few times. They noticed a lot of inconsistencies in the timeline that he gave and what his family members were saying. The case kept going. And in 1995, there was an incident where Cates admitted to his family that he took John's life. But because of how evidence and technology were at the time, there wasn't enough evidence to charge Cates. In 2020, a family member of Cates contacted Orange County Sheriff's Office about the cold case. The family member said that they really care about the case, even if they were the suspect's family because John was very, very good to the Cates family. He would give them money at the time when they needed it or a place to stay. Detectives started looking into the case more and spoke to Cates' wife and daughter. In March of 2022, they began more extensive interviews with the family members. Investigators then learned that his family was in fear of him because he was very abusive to them. In April 2022, Cates was in a hospital in North Carolina. He told a nurse that he took someone's life in Florida in 1992. The nurse told a security guard and they did research and found John's case on the sheriff's office website. Officers with the Salisbury Police Department in North Carolina responded to the hospital and obtained Cates' confession on body camera video. Cates didn't explain the motive during his confession but said that he hit John with a stick. Investigators were able to confirm from Cates' family members that he used a walking stick to get around and that he owned the one that was found at the crime scene. Detectives then had enough evidence at that point to interview Cates again and charge him. Cates was arrested on August 5, 2022 and is being held in a North Carolina jail waiting to be taken back to Florida. Orange County Sheriff John Minas said the Sheriff's Office started its cold case team in 2020. Since then, the team has solved 13 cases dating back to 1984. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in the comments section. 36-year-old Jasmine Porter lived in the Bronx, New York City in 1996. She had a four-year-old son and was pregnant. On February 3rd, an unknown man entered her home and violently strangled her. Her body was found on February 5th. The four-year-old son was also found in their Morris Heights apartment. He was fortunately left unharmed by the perpetrator. Investigators found DNA under Jasmine's fingernails that belonged to the culprit. In 2021, with DNA technology being a lot more advanced than it was back in 1996, investigators submitted the DNA into the combined DNA index system. In 2022, investigators received results that it matched the DNA of six-year-old Gregory Fleetwood. He was arrested at his home in the Bronx in August 2022. Fleetwood already had a history of violence toward women before he took Jasmine's life. In 1987, he was arrested and charged with manslaughter for strangling a woman he knew in the Bronx. He served seven years for that attack. The victim, Linda Miller, was also pregnant at the time. Fleetwood and Linda were what he called drug buddies. He took Linda's life and then called 911 to admit what had just happened. Fleetwood was released in August 1994, 18 months before he took Jasmine's life. Investigators said that Jasmine and Fleetwood did not know each other. They did not mention what the motive is. Fleetwood is currently proclaiming his innocence. I have never seen that woman before in my life, Clint Fleetwood said. I don't know who that is. I have no explanation for why my DNA is under her fingernails. Even more damning though is that the investigators also found that Fleetwood's DNA was a match for an assault in the building next door to Jasmine's home about a month after her life was taken. Fleetwood faces a maximum of 25 years to life if convicted. New York Police Department Commissioner Kachan Sal said, not once in 26 years did the detectives waver in the pursuit of justice for Jasmine and their dedication led to an arrest. 44-year-old Karen Johnson Swift lived in Dyersburg, Tennessee in 2011. She was married to David Swift and they had four children together. David was the last person to see Karen alive after she returned home from a Halloween party on the night of October 30, 2011. 
She was missing for over a month before hunters discovered her body in a cemetery near her home on December 10th of the same year. The autopsy report that was released stated Karen suffered blunt force trauma to the head. She was also found partially clothed and had other injuries at the time she was found. Investigators spoke with family and friends trying to find any useful information. Karen's friends told police that she was a good friend who was witty, kind, and strong-willed except when it came to her husband who always told her what to do. Investigators also found that Karen filed for divorce three weeks before she had disappeared. Finally, on August 9, 2022, David Swift was arrested in connection to the case. He was arrested in Alabama where he now lives with his new wife. The arrest was made by members of the Dyer County Sheriff's Office with assistance from the members of the Jefferson County, Alabama Sheriff's Office. Dyer County Sheriff Jeff Box said he was pleased after the grand jury announced an indictment against Swift on August 8th. He also said that he kept in touch with Karen's mother, Carol Johnson, throughout the years. As soon as David Swift was placed in handcuffs, I called Carol and told her the news. I always told her I had faith this case would be prosecuted. And today we had a very emotional conversation. She just wants justice for her daughter. Box said his office has literally spent thousands of hours on this case and a lot of time was spent dispelling false information and rumors. Investigators never gave up and just kept going through the evidence. The one thing that held true since the early stages of the investigation was that David was always a suspect because all the evidence pointed to him. We were able to rule anyone and everyone else out and the grand jury made the right decision today by indicting him. I am so glad the district attorney, our prosecutor, had enough interest in the case to present it to the grand jury. I thank District Attorney General Danny Goodman for seeing this through and he did the right thing today. Box did not specify what new evidence led to the arrest. If convicted, Swift faces up to life in prison without the possibility of parole. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in the comments section. Eight-year-old Athena Ducat lived in Upper Arlington, Ohio in 1980. She went by the nickname Sini. Sini left her home to go to school on June 3rd. She attended Barrington Elementary School. At 4.34, her parents reported her missing when she was still not home. The distance between their home and the school was 12 blocks or about one mile. She always made it home before 4 p.m. Three hours later, Sini's body was found in a drainage ditch less than one block from her home. She suffered blunt force trauma to the head and manual strangulation. She had been beaten with a 20-pound limestone rock. Investigators believe that she was abducted and that her life was taken at a location other than where she was discovered. Sini's case shook the Columbus suburb and led to the formation of the community-based group The Long Walk Home, the Asenath Dakot Project. The group formed and started aiding investigators in finding the person responsible. Recently, they requested a re-examination of every piece of DNA evidence taken from Sini's autopsy. On top of forensic examinations, police conducted numerous interviews with previous persons of interest and former investigators connected to the case. Then, on August 11, 2022, the Upper Arlington Police Division announced that the person responsible for what happened to Sini was a man named Brent L. Strutner. Strutner, who would have been 20 years old back in 1980, lived locally and had graduated from Upper Arlington High School in 1979, according to police. He took his own life in Columbus, Ohio in 1984 at the age of 24. Police Sergeant Brian McCain stated that they linked Strutner to the crime scene years ago, but it was advances in DNA and recent interviews that made police confident they had their man. We wanted to make sure all the pieces and parts were tied together before we released anything, said McCain. Police Chief Steve Farmers said, Investigators for the Upper Arlington Division have tirelessly pursued justice for the Ducat family for more than four decades. I am the sixth chief to oversee these efforts and appreciate the hard work that has been put into this case through the years. Chief Farmer extended peace and healing to the Ducat family. Sini's friend Leslie Lyon reacted to the bittersweet news, saying, Why did it have to happen in the first place? This senseless, senseless thing. There will always be a sadness. The website, The Long Walk Home, The Asenath Dakot Project, has acknowledged the recent development but rejects the notion that the case has reached any semblance of finality. They believe that Brent Strutner did not act alone and point to a man called Robert Chris Winchester. 
Winchester has committed similar crimes in the area and was a known associate of Strutner. Investigators are still looking for any link between Winchester and Sini's case. 15-year-old Karen Stitt lived in Palo Alto, California in 1982. Karen was last seen alive on the evening of September 2nd. Earlier that night, she took a bus from Palo Alto to Sunnyvale, California to visit her boyfriend. Around midnight, her boyfriend walked her to a bus stop so she could head back home. Afraid of breaking curfew, the boyfriend ran back home before making sure she caught the late bus. Karen's body was found roughly a hundred yards away from the bus stop the next morning. Her wrists were bound with her shirt and her legs were bound with her jacket. She had been stabbed 59 times. At approximately 10.45 a.m. on September 3, 1982, Stephen Bound, a truck driver, was making a delivery to the Woolworth Garden Center. During his delivery, Mr. Bound saw what he believed was a female lying in the bushes at the base of a center block retaining wall along the Garden Center driveway. He contacted the Woolworth Garden Center management, who then called the Sunnyvale Department of Public Safety. Looking at crime scene photos, investigators saw that leaves and dirt around Karen's feet had been disturbed and kicked, suggesting that she was still alive when her body was left there. Investigators found male DNA on Karen's leather jacket. They also made a timeline of events leading up to her body being found. They found that Karen and her boyfriend David got drinks at the 7-Eleven, walked north to the Gulf and Western Golf Course before heading to the bus station. David at one point became a likely suspect but was ruled out as a suspect as his DNA did not match the DNA found on Karen's jacket. The case eventually went cold and languished for decades. That was until 2021 when an anonymous tip to the police changed everything. Sunnyvale Department of Public Safety Detective Matthew Hutchins received information that a son of Rose Aguilera Ramirez took Karen's life. Detective Hutchins then used publicly available databases to locate an obituary for Rose Aguilera. On the obituary, it said she was survived by four sons. Throughout 2021 and the early months of 2022, Hutchinson determined that two of the Ramirez children were not responsible. Another one of the four sons was ruled out as his DNA did not match the male DNA found on the leather jacket. That left only one son, Gary Jean Ramirez. In July of 2022, after further DNA testing, investigators were able to confirm that he was responsible for taking the life of Karen Stitt. Ramirez lived in Fresno, California at the time of the crime. He is a retired bug exterminator and Air Force veteran. Detective Hutchinson and other officers arrested Ramirez at his home in Maui, Hawaii, on August 2, 2022. He appeared very shocked and only uttered the words, oh my gosh. Ramirez is currently locked up in a Maui jail while waiting to be transported to California. Ramirez's brother, Rudy Ramirez, has commented that his brother does not have a criminal record and it's hard to conceive that he carried out such a grisly crime. I've never seen him violent or get angry ever. He wouldn't hurt a fly. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in the comments section. On June 3, 1991, at approximately 10 a.m., two passers-by found a woman's body in the grass on the northwest corner of Olive and Craig Street in Ebencrest, Ohio. The woman was identified as 30-year-old Alma Renee Lake. She had been strangled, bound, and there were signs she had been assaulted. DNA belonging to a male was collected from the crime scene and stored so it could be used later. Five years later, on November 11, 1996, the body of 36-year-old Michelle Dawson Possen Pass was found in Granville, Ohio. She was last seen walking to a friend's house. DNA belonging to a man was taken from her body. And after testing, investigators noticed that the same man was responsible for taking the lives of both Alma and Michelle. In March of 2021, investigators used genetic genealogy to connect Robert Edwards to both crimes. In an interview with the investigators, Edward denied knowing the victims and said he was not involved in what happened to them. Investigators obtained a DNA sample from him and gave it to the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigations. In 2022, it was confirmed that Edwards was responsible for taking the lives of both Alma and Michelle. 67-year-old Robert Edwards was arrested at his home in Columbus, Ohio on August 5, 2022. 
During a news conference at which family members of the two victims were present, Franklin County's Sheriff Dallas Baldwin said Edwards' arrest demonstrates the persistence of law enforcement. I can't imagine what it's like for a family to go 30 plus years not knowing what happened to their loved one, he said. Today, at least we can bring some closure. 28-year-old Nancy Binalik lived in Sacramento County, California in 1970. She was engaged to public defender Ferris Salami. Nancy was last seen alive by Ferris on October 25, 1970, around 11.30 p.m. in her apartment on Bell Street. The next morning, Nancy did not show up for her work as a court reporter. A colleague then called her son to check up on Nancy. A manager who oversaw Nancy's apartment building used the pass key to unlock her door. Inside, they found Nancy's body. She had been stabbed more than 30 times and defense wounds suggested that she fought back. Nancy always left her sliding glass door ajar to allow her cat to go outside on a second-story balcony. Investigators determined that the culprit entered through the sliding door. They also found a trail of blood that began on the balcony and led to a sidewalk below, ending in a parking lot. Detectives theorized that the suspect cut himself while committing the crime and then likely left in a vehicle from the aforementioned parking lot. A DNA profile was developed from the blood trail left at the scene. The male profile was uploaded to the combined DNA index system, CODES, a national forensics database, but there were no matches. Recently, the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office cold case team and the County District's Attorney's Office retested the DNA and concluded that Richard John Davis is responsible for taking the life of Nancy. He was 27 years old back in 1970 and lived in the same apartment complex as Nancy. Unfortunately, there will be no criminal prosecution as Davis passed away on November 2, 1997. Investigators have found no link between Nancy and Davis other than geography. They know it's a premeditated crime as he had masking tape over every one of his fingers to seal his fingerprints, but they did not know what the motive could be. Davis did not have a violent history, only a drunk driving history. He passed away due to conditions related to alcoholism. Unfortunately, Ferris Salami did not live to see the conclusion of the case. He passed away in 2014, always wondering who was the man who took his fiancée. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in the comments section. Also, if you like this content, subscribe please. We are very close to 1,000 family. Let's continue the video.